I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that the world might believe that you have sent me. The church of Christ upon earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one. All that are enabled through grace to make a profession of their faith in and obedience to Christ and to manifest the reality of it in their tempers and conduct should consider each other as the precious saints of God, should love each other as sisters and brothers, children of the same family and father, temples of the same spirit, members of the same body, subjects of the same grace, objects of the same love, bought with the same price and joint heirs of the same inheritance, whom God hath thus joined together, no human should dare to put asunder. 2,000 years ago, the last recorded prayer from the mouth of Christ before being led to his crucifixion was a passionate plea for the unity of his followers. He named that unity as the single most convincing evidence to the world that he was indeed who he said he was, sent from God. 200 years ago, Thomas Campbell wrote the Declaration and Address, the bicentennial of which we celebrate today. Tired of the bitter spirit of division he had experienced first in Northern Ireland and Scotland and then in the United States, Campbell and others called Christians to come together in every locality to work and worship, not based on intellectual agreement on a set of propositions, but on their shared commitment to Christ, demonstrated, demonstrated by their love for one another and for the world. We've not done a very good job of answering the prayer of Jesus. Even the movement that Thomas Campbell helped begin, a movement that was calling for the visible unity of the church, has itself contributed to the scandal of division that Christianity shows to the world. Division among Christians has existed for so long that it has become accepted as the way things are supposed to be sort of assumed. Some oppose efforts at visible unity because they see themselves as the only legitimate followers of Christ. And since they are united, there's nothing to do except convince people to come to them. But many, perhaps most of us, are simply comfortable with the way things are. Forging relationships Finding ways of doing things together in the name of Christ for the sake of the world takes effort and determination and courage and persistence. We are too self-sufficient and we are impoverished because of it. Some resist work for Christian visible unity because they believe such efforts lead to compromise and abandonment of commitments. Recognizing our oneness in Christ, however, does not mean sentimental relativism that refuses to take God's ideals seriously. Bland toleration is as potentially devastating to the visible unity of Christians as a rigid hair-splitting doctrinal precision. Christians are charged with being able to articulate their faith, to give an answer to anyone who asks. 
We must understand, however, that doctrine is not an end in itself. It is not the point. The point of sound or healthy doctrine is to transform us into the likeness of Christ. The Christ who was willing to give up all his rights, all his prerogatives, all his preferences for the sake of others, according to Philippians 2. Any attempt to arrive at correct doctrine that results in the works of the flesh, including strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, and division, is in fact a perversion of sound doctrine and a fundamental misunderstanding of the point of Christianity, which is transformation and reconciliation. The truth is that God has already created the unity of his church. We do not create unity. There is one body, according to Ephesians 4. The foundation for that oneness is being in Christ and being increasingly transformed into his likeness. But we have been charged with maintaining that unity, making it visible. James North of Christian Churches and Churches of Christ and Barry Callan of the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, wrote in 1997 a book titled, Coming Together in Christ. They made a statement that I believe is true and key to both unity and evangelism. And this is that quote. There's nothing inherently divisive in a group of Christians following the natural sociological process of denominating itself. Diversity is not division when the spirit of relating to those beyond the group is kept alive. Diversity is one thing. A spirit of division is quite another. Every Christian has a legacy in every other Christian. We experience that legacy only as we receive each other and relate to each other. The barriers that separate followers of Christ, whether they are organizational or creedal, doctrinal, or whether they are attitudes of distrust and misunderstanding and arrogance and gossip and smug stereotyping, Whatever the barriers are, they will come down only after Christians are humbled. Only when Christians are brought to deep personal conviction that our disunity is contrary to the will of God and that we cannot continue to lean on our own understandings, only then can God recreate or restore us according to to his will. Only by humbling ourselves before God and each other can he lift us up and work through us.